Okay, you asked for it, so we're bringing it. Uh, actually, I asked for it, um, but uh, so many people have been bringing this up, and it's something I found really interesting about the Gon uh, before he got sent back to jail video. Right. Talking uh -huh. about, uh, he was defending his uh, style, which was uh, perceived and criticized by Japanese managers as being a dictatorial sort of expat right. leader. Right, yes, exactly. That's the line that Nissan has had, right? Yeah, so I really want to ask... Um, Rochelle today, particularly about expat leadership styles and the tension between, um, you know, visionary but forceful leadership versus uh, consensus-based leadership, uh, particularly coming to Japan. should be interesting. Yes. So, Rochelle, I know that you are a keen follower of the entire Carlos Ghosn situation. Yes, I certainly am, yes. So, is it, is it a scary time to be a, an expat manager or company boss in Japan? Well, I think a lot of people feel that way. I think yeah. a lot of people are very nervous. I think that it's going to be harder for companies to hire people to take those roles here. I think particularly for Japanese companies, but also for foreign firms as well. So do you think the... So I, certainly there's been a scare. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the scare is justified? Do you think the risk of ending up like Carlos Ghosn is actually uh, uh, something anyone coming to Japan should worry about, or do you think it's overblown? Oh, I, I kind of have two feelings. Yeah. I think, you know, that was, the, the Nissan situation was kind of an extreme and complicated one, yes. and so I think it's unlikely that your typical manager would find themselves in exactly that position. And that's a pretty much a worst case scenario. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty bad. It's probably, it's, well, the thing is, the whole thing, the story behind it is extremely complicated. Right. Um, on the other hand, this whole incident has made a lot more people aware of how Japan's legal system works. Certainly. And it's not necessarily a very flattering picture, right? Yeah. And so other non-Japanese have been caught up in the Japanese justice system and then had difficult stories. Um, there's a guy that I know from Chicago named Stephen Gann, mm. and he has a book about his story, about how he was in detention for a really long time until he confessed. Yeah. It's not, um, it's not necessarily yeah. a, a comforting picture. Yeah. Right? And actually, what I, what I like to point out about this case as well, and it's the same with family law as with the criminal justice system and the way that that works. Um, typically, a light gets shown on it when someone famous or foreign gets tied up in it, but these issues are the same for Japanese oh, people. Oh, exactly, yes. Um, mm -hmm. The lesson is, Japanese or foreign or whatever, you don't want to end up in a, in a detention situation right. because um, you can be detained for extremely long periods of time. And it's basically, it's like if a democratic election has a 99% uh, you know, result, you know that the system is broken. And when a justice system has a 99% conviction rate, it's a sign that, you right. know, There's things are not working yeah. as they should. Exactly, yes. So perhaps the... Uh, Having your company try to get you strung up by the police is an extreme scenario. <laughs> right, this is a very extreme scenario. Uh, yeah, and I've never actually heard of it going quite that far, actually going to like uh, prosecutors with it. But right. the old uh, palace coup from the local company is a pretty common play, actually. Yeah, uh, yeah it usually doesn't go to the legal authorities, though, right? No. It's usually happen it happens internally, right? That's right. Yeah. But um, you can sort of see... There's all sorts of stories and rumors and uh, sides of the story being told about, you know, how Nissan ended up in this situation. Right. Um, and Carlos Ghosn himself, in his video where he kind of gave his side of the story, it was only a seven-minute video. It's posted on YouTube, and actually, I'll, if I, I'll try to link it in the description below. Oh. Um, what interested me was he actually did a small Japan Business Time uh, episode. <laughs> <in it. laughs> yeah. Uh, it was a it was a self defense. Right. Um, well, uh, why it was be good to be a dictator, right? Or, yeah, or they no, call me a dictator. Yes. If that's what you want to call it, that's fine. But you know, to save Nissan, I needed to make big decisions. I needed to have vision, and my fear for Nissan is that uh, the current leadership is a consensus oriented. They have no vision. They have no plan, and this is going to put Nissan back in the hole where it was, and that's my fear. Uh, it's a reasonable fear given the situation, actually. Yeah. Yes. Uh, but, but it also, but also too, it raises a question for me as a leadership expert hearing that. Yeah. Okay, he thinks all the people leading Nissan don't have vision. Mm. Why didn't he find someone with vision and hire them and put them in those places the last 20 years? He was running the company. If all these people who are there are really not up to snuff, isn't that his fault? Yes. And, and, and also, it kind of reflects 
uh, his perception of himself a little bit as well. Well, of course, yeah. Uh, he, he, he introduces himself as the savior of Nisan, and look, I think he's got a claim was, to that. He was, he was, yes. Mm -hmm. He has a claim to that. Uh, you know, he likes to emphasize this company wouldn't be anything without me, and you know, I love it, and so on. But, uh, but in terms of he, he identified a tension that really does exist in almost every international company in Japan. This balance between uh, this sort of uh, command and control structure that uh, is pretty typical of Western corporate leadership, right? And especially when dealing with uh, you know remote branch offices in other countries and going out there and getting them into line and with the program, right? And um, the, the 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 Japanese sort of quiet resistance to that, often based on um, ignoring people or this idea of going around and. Uh, this kind of unspoken coordination and consensus. Right. Well, also with a foreign company, you have this feeling of, oh, this is the next person who's come in here. They'll be gone in a couple of years. Right. We'll just wait them out. Right. right. There's a lot of that that happens. So I did ask this uh, a good question for you. Okay, I'm, in a, I, I'm sitting in my office in Chicago. I've just been told we're sending you out to the Japan office. Sales aren't picking up, you know, profitability is low, we want you to go there and, uh, you know, get them, turn the office around. Right, okay. And uh, not knowing anything, people get very energized and excited, they're going to a new country, they've got lots of great ideas, yeah, this is their chance to be a leader. Right. Um, what's your advice to that person about to go to Japan? Okay, the advice that I have to that person is, go to Japan and listen first. You may have a variety of ideas of things that worked in Chicago, wherever. Yeah. They won't necessarily work in Japan. They so might. They might, but yeah. not necessarily. But right. first, learn a lot more about what's going on. Mm. And also by talking to people mm. for really your first like, you know, 30 or 60 days, you'll also show them that you're listening to them. So you'll get the information, but you're also showing, I'm not just going to come here and impose something. Let's mm. work together. Okay, so it sounds a little bit like you're advocating for a consensus-oriented management style. Well, you know, I, I think that word consensus is a little bit tricky, but what I would say yeah. is, I mean, you're not going to have anything happen mm. if you don't get those people on your side. Certainly. And so you have to find what they care about. Yeah. And you also have to understand the situation to make sure what you're suggesting actually is going to work in the environment. Yeah. Now, you may have things that you want them to do that people don't like yeah. and sometimes you have to do that as a leader so yeah. I wouldn't say you have to get everyone to agree with everything all the time yeah. consensus but at least go in first and with open ears and like assess the situation yeah I think the point is is that there's clearly you know a spectrum you know you you can't be completely differential to consensus and paralyzed by that uh, at the same time it, and again, uh, Carlos Ghosn seemed to be anticipating the criticism. Uh, and, and clearly the story is he got off the plane in Japan 20 years ago and he started you know, issuing orders and he was energetic enough to follow through and, and push them through when people felt like they weren't being listened to and consulted. Mm -hmm. and, and he points out, and look, I was successful. Uh, aren't I wonderful? <laughs> uh, and, and this clearly, uh, those things, no matter how successful, no matter how true that statement is that he saved right. the company, um, you know that that's no doubt fed into what built up to an extreme outcome, but you know, well, yeah, it could well, have happened well, in other ways. Right. Well, the thing is, and I wrote about this on my blog as well, you know, I feel like his big mistake was he didn't do that Japanese thing of reading the air. Yeah. I mean, he, <laughs> he was all. busy flying around the world, yeah. actually not spending that much time in Japan recently. Yeah. He had no real sense for how people were feeling. Meanwhile, this massive resentment was bubbling up yeah. for all these reasons, and he, he had no clue, and he was blindsided. Mm -hmm. And so really, if you're leading a Japanese organization, you have to be in touch with it. Yeah. And there was no Japanese person who liked him enough to give him a heads up. Yeah. And that's a really big criticism, too, right? Yeah. So this is the thing. I, I loved his... Uh... He put it eloquently, his sort of self-justification for his style and, and, and doing it the way that he did it. And frankly, he was speaking to the way I think most expat bosses who get sent to Japan want to do things. The thing is, in 90% of those cases where I've seen people come and step off the plane and try to do the Carlos Ghosn routine, it really falls flat. Right. And Carlos Ghosn is just an incredibly energetic and charismatic and, you know, obviously he's a very competent person. and he. he you should look at the success that he had, I think, as certainly there's positive lessons to be taken from it, and Japanese leaders should also learn positive lessons from it. 
But at the same time, yes, the the things that he did would normally lead you to get tripped up, and you know. Right, but, but I, mean, I would sort of say that Nissan was a special situation. Yeah. That it was, it was in, in dire trouble. enough shape. It was such a mess that the only way to fix it yeah. was to really come in and do the slash and burn stuff that he did. Yeah. But your your average Japanese organization maybe isn't quite in that much of a peril yeah. and might not be as amenable to that approach, right? And by the way, I give almost exactly the same advice. I've done this so many times where we've had the new expat boss and I tell them to slow down um, and <laughs> do a couple of scoping trips and on those trips, don't, don't start with leading out with your program and looking for uh, allies to start taking over and stuff like that. Come and at least make people feel like they've been listened to. Um, yeah. I mean, it's really the best thing you have to do, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, it was kind of funny. Although he put his case forcefully, I actually disagree with it, and I kind of thought, well, that's kind of partly where, why you are where you are. Although right, I right. think I respect the success that he's had. Right. Well, the problem is, is he had that success twenty years ago, yeah. but he didn't change the strategy after that. Yeah. Even though the situation changed. Yeah. Right. And by the way, saying saying that I disagree with him isn't to say that I agree with what's happened to him, well, or well, that I'm advocating on behalf of the people who. Probably also, it seems, have their own flaws and issues. The thing is, that should never have become something that went to the authorities. Not at all. It was a, internal governance issues that should have been handled internally, and the fact that they brought prosecutors in it and had, had them hauled off to jail, is, it's embarrassing. Yes, although the story continues to evolve, um, and maybe the prosecutors are getting lucky as they take advantage of the detentions to investigate more. Right, right. and they're, they're finding something that maybe they can do something with, maybe. But certainly the original excuses just seemed really weak. Yeah, they're pretty weak. And, and my thought was as well, the deferred compensation thing, every, uh, you know, old boy president of big, every Japanese big corporation should be hauled into jail. Uh, if, if, if that was a process, that. a problem, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so a really interesting story, and we're probably going to come back to it in future seasons. Right, exactly, because uh, it's going to keep going <laughs> yeah, so for sure years. I'll get the download. <laughs> right. So, uh, yeah, hang around again next week for more okay. Japan Business Time. Thanks. Well, well, I mean, well, the whole thing is is that this should never have become a lawsuit. This is a corporate governance problem. Okay, well, well something happened. Why did that light go up? I don't um, know. They heard us talking. <laughs> Let me, okay. One minute.